Hey everyone, I'm Colby Fayok. I'm a developer advocate at Apple Tools, and I'm super excited to talk to you about testing beyond the DOM today. So let's get started. So the future is now, and we're going to look at how we can be testing beyond the DOM. So who am I? I'm Colby Fayok. I'm the one hugging BB-8 and Kylo Ren over there. I work with the dev community as a developer advocate for Apple Tools. You can find me pretty much anywhere on the web by just Googling my name as I'm the only one in the world. So we're going to start off by bringing out Danny Tanner, who remembers America's Funniest Home Videos. I'm pretty sure every country had something similar to this, much like the Got Talent series, but instead of playing Funniest Video, we're going to play some UI Gone Wrong. So first up, we have Safeway, a regional supermarket here in the US, who also has a pharmacy wing. If I'm trying to sign up to get my flu shot or whatever type of prescription, I need to be able to fill out that form. Overlapping inputs are going to give you a hard time trying to fill that out. Depending on the positioning, you may simply not be able to. Maybe you can tab your way through with your keyboard, but are non-technical people going to realize that they can do that and be sure that the info is actually right? This is going to prevent customers from filling out the form. For a business, that's lost revenue. For patients, that's making it harder for them to get their prescription. And I would imagine all of us know what Gmail is, so I can save time and skip the introduction. And I think one of the more compelling features about Gmail is its powerful search. I've blurred out the names here to protect this person's privacy, but we have a big issue here. We clearly have a disconnected UI. The search results don't typically have all those options. Those icons are showing overlapped with our results that are from a single message. Is this some kind of Zindex issue? How would we even test that? Well, while we probably all think about how this would impact our personal inbox, like losing a message from a, our favorite aunts, or how about our email for work, where you just lost a big lead or an important email from your boss? Or how about WebEx, the remote meeting software? This is more of an annoyance probably, but if I'm trying to unsubscribe from a newsletter, I feel a bit unsettled with a form that's looking like this. Companies already go out of their way to try to prevent people from leaving. Is that the case here, or is this just a bug? I'm here because I don't want to get their emails anymore. Is this form even going to work? And finally, Amazon. I think we all know what Amazon is. And while I admittedly buy too much off of Amazon, they make it really easy. This is a good way to keep me from buying something. Who am I kidding? I'd probably spin up dev tools and fix this just to buy it, but most people wouldn't. And those are missed sales for Amazon. While one or two probably won't matter, at Amazon scale, if everyone's getting this experience, that's a lot of missed sales. This isn't meant to shame any of those companies or developers. Bugs happen to everyone. If you look at the attendee above your name in the audience list and then look at the attendee below, chances are one of you have written a bug within the last week. And that's totally okay. No one's pointing fingers and no one should be pointing fingers. But getting good test coverage isn't always as easy as just add tests. So what actually makes it so hard? Well, whether you have one giant end-to-end -end test or a hundred unit tests, all those tests take time to write. They also require a lot of code. That code, just like features, needs to be maintained. That code, like feature code, might have bugs and increase in complexity. Tests can easily lead to technical debt and end up frustrating developers when broken and left untouched. And speaking of those broken tests, they're often fragile. They depend on hard-coded IDs or super-specific selectors where one little change and that test is broken. I may or may not have accidentally removed an ID for testing and broke tests before. As a new developer, where the testing wasn't integrated into the development flow, I didn't know any better. Those things happen, but they end up breaking your tests. And you're thinking it, I'm thinking it. The time your team is spending on tests is time your team can't build new features. And your project stakeholders typically want visible progress. I know that, you know that, but it's just as important to keep existing features working as it is to build new ones. Otherwise, you're spending more time refactoring that old code, trying to get it working again, which can be even less fun after a bug prevents your customers from actually being able to shop. But like this guy out here in the mountains, we're all probably thinking the same thing. There's got to be a better way. And before you go spend a weekend out there just to think about your tests, Here's the moment where the actor says the name of the movie. Let's start testing beyond the DOM. And spoilers, we're going to do that with Cypress and Apple tools. So let's look at an example of what I mean. If I have a form on my website, I hopefully have some tests set up for that actual endpoint. 
so that I always know that submitting form data to an endpoint actually works. But as we can see here, testing that endpoint doesn't mean that it's usable. First, I want something to go through and actually fill out that form. I want each input tested in the browser. That will let me know when it's actually working for customers. I also need to know that beyond the inputs functionally working, that it's actually usable. And with a huge website, we might not have time or resources to go through every single page manually, not to mention on every single device. Similarly with Gmail, if I make a search, that endpoint to get my results might work, but is the UI working? I need to make sure that someone can actually click on those elements, or in this case, that someone can't click on those elements. But what, I wanna make sure that someone can visit that first result. I also need to make sure, again, my search results are usable. This is going to confuse the heck out of somebody. What buttons should they actually click? Are they going to accidentally delete an email if they try clicking that first result? Same goes for WebEx and Amazon's quantity selection. We need to be able to test these things the way that we as humans are actually using it. We need to literally give our tests a second pair of eyes. So let's start with Cypress. Cypress is a JavaScript-based testing framework that tests real projects in the browser. It's easily installable as an NPM package where you can start running through a UI in the browser just like a human would. For example, if I wanted to log into my application, fill out the username and password, and make sure that someone can actually log in, I can do that with just these few lines of code. Like our Safeway example from earlier, I can use Cypress to fill out each of those form fields and even hit the submit button and confirm that not only that the API is working, but the UI is successfully taking that information and sending it to the UI. But like we talked about before, this isn't necessarily doing anything to help fix what people are seeing. We need a way to give our tests vision, allowing them to see what our customers are seeing. And this is where AppliTools comes in. AppliTools is an automated visual testing platform, powered by AI, might I add, that automatically ensures you're maintaining a high level of quality for your apps. Back to our code example, we can add AppliTools with the Cypress SDK, just a few lines, and instantly get visual testing coverage. By running AppliTools eyes on your project, you're using real images that show what the users of your website or app are actually seeing. This is critical, where a broken image might not show up in a failed test or an unusable form like before. But by using visual testing, you can make sure you're catching all user-facing bugs. But part of what makes AppliTools awesome is not only that it's checking for differences, but it's powered by AI. So to show a quick example of this, let's play spot the difference. How many can you find? I'll give you a few seconds. I found three differences. The little hat logo, what's on the plate, the ketchup top. Let's see how visual testing picks this up. That's not looking too good. I thought visual testing was the savior. You probably couldn't tell, but these pictures were off by just a few pixels, meaning the entire image ends up being different. This is how a lot of the testing platforms work. They're not o they're only smart enough to actually see pixel by pixel changes, which in this case isn't helpful at all. But by flipping on Apple tools, we can see that we're able to pick up all the right differences. And looks like I was right. We have the hat logo, the plate, and the bottle top. Apple Tools was able to intelligently look at those images, spotting not only the differences, but why they were different, which gives us more meaningful results. While the spot, while the spot, the difference is a lot of fun. This is even more helpful in the context of the web, where between our two login forms, we might not have been able to catch that broken image or alignment issues with just some code scripts, but we're able to spot those differences with the Apple Tools. And like our Gmail example before, the changes are going to get highlighted right on the real image of the page. Those bugs never stood a chance. So let's break down how this works for a second. Apple Tools supports a wide variety of SDKs, from web-based testing frameworks like Cypress and Selenium to native platforms like Appium and Espresso. Whatever testing framework you're using, Apple Tools likely supports and will help you get immediately productive. For our example, of course, we're looking at Cypress. The way that it works is we'll first install the SDK in our project straight from NPM. We then call that SDK to capture our snapshot. Once that happens, the SDK will extract that snapshot of the DOM or the document object model, which is the underlying tree of elements inside of the browser. Then upload that snapshot to Apple Tools. 
And with those snapshots, Apple Tools will use its visual grid and depending on your configuration to generate those screenshots. Where finally, Apple Tools eyes will use machine learning to compare those images and intelligently look for differences, where it will then show those differences in the UI. So to do this, you can use the Apple Tools eyes Cypress SDK. It's an NPM package that makes it easy to install right inside of your node project. And to see how all that works, we're going to run through a quick demo of adding Apple Tools to some existing Cypress tests. So here's what I'm going to go through. We're going to start off with a simple existing project that I set up ahead of time. We're going to first review that project. I'll already have Cypress installed with a test. So we'll run that test and check out what's going on. After we're happy with Cypress, we're going to check out Apple Tools for our visual testing and add a test and run those tests. So let's get started. So I'm going to start off with this video game store that I created kind of as a demo where we can see we have a bunch of games right here on the homepage. If we click through to one of these products, we can see that we have the price and we have an add to cart button. If we hit this add to cart button, like a typical e-commerce store, we're able to see that we have the shopping cart that we can hover over and we even see the item inside of the cart where we can finally then go check out for our project. So let's actually see what this looks like if we want to test it inside of Cyprus, where the most common user flow for e-commerce stores is actually going from point A, where you're selecting your product and adding it to the cart and checking out. So we're going to open up our code editor. We're inside of here. I already mentioned that we have Cyprus set up and I even have a test where we're first going to visit that URL, where it's going to open up that e-commerce store for us. We're going to go through, we're going to find all the games, and we're going to grab the first, the one index, which is the second item in the list. We're going to grab the ID. We're going to make sure that we can navigate to it by clicking through and making sure that we're on the right page after clicking through. Next, we're going to click the add to cart button, which is going to add that item that we're trying to purchase to the cart. We're going to then try to make sure that the subtotal, the cost that was in the navigation bar, is actually showing the right value compared to what it was when we clicked it. And then we're going to show that menu. When we're using Cypress, we want to invoke the show command where it's going to force that menu to open since it's typically on hover. We're then finally going to click the cart button, which is going to take us to the cart page where we'll make sure that we're on the right page with the cart. So we can see what this actually looks like by opening up Cypress. And I'm going to run this test where as soon as I click that spec, it's going to open up a new instance of Chrome. And we can see that it very quickly went through and already ran our test. So starting from the top, it visited that video game store URL. It first went through and found that second game or the one index. It then went through and clicked that, uh, the link so that it went to the product, the games page. It then found that button where it added it, the item to the cart. We're making sure that we're showing the correct total in the navigation, as well as forcing that menu to be shown, where we're finally going to click for checkout, and we're going to land on that cart page and making sure that we're ready to actually check out with that item. So as we're going through, we saw that we were able to easily automate that entire process going from finding a product in the first place all the way through checking out a product towards the end. But another issue that we might have faced is we want to figure out how are we able to actually catch visual regressions if they incur in our application. And the way that we're going to test that is I set up the second branch of my store where it looks exactly the same. But if I click into one of these products and I add it to the cart, we can see that this time, if I'm hovering over this navigation with this cart, I can't actually get to that checkout button. What's happening here is even if we inspect this and look inside of the DOM is somebody accidentally added a position of relative and a Z index to this navigation. Who knows, maybe they wanted to add some fancy search effects or something with the UI so that it showed overlapping onto the header or the body. But when that happens, we're now covering up that cart menu. So we can't actually reach that checkout button to give our, our hard-earned money to the video game store. So if we're going to try that out in Cypress, let's see what happens when we push that in. So I'm going to go back to my code and at the top here, I'm going to swap in this, this branch URL so that I can see what happens when I run those tests. And if I open back up Cypress, we can see that when I hit save, it automatically restarted that test. But as we're going through, just like before we first visited that URL, we select that second item. 
We even add it to the cart towards the end here. And we even show that menu just like before. And you might already see what's happening here. We can still even click that button, that checkout button and go to the cart. Now at this point, Cypress did its hard work and it did what it's strong, what it's actually strong at capable of doing by showing that it's fact, uh, functionally working and that we were able to test that end to end flow. But what we can do is we can strengthen our Cypress test by adding another level of visual testing. And to do that, we're going to use Apple tools, which is as we described before, an automated visual testing platform where we're able to compare images, the different states of our application to make sure that they're working and looking exactly as expected, just like the people who are visiting our application, our customers are actually seeing it. And to do that, we're going to use the Cypress Eyes SDK, where we can see that we can install it just like an NPM package, like we typically would. We can even set up the configuration, which would add a plugin for us, as well as some custom commands, and we can get started immediately. So I actually already installed Apple Tools into our project, so we'll be ready to go. The only thing that we need to do is we need to head over to Apple Tools, where I already have an account. So if you're get for just getting started, you can create your free account at appletools.com. But here I logged into my free account and I have my dashboard set up where we're going to be able to see our tests once we first run them. So the first thing we need to do is go to the menu where I'm going to grab my API key. I'm going to select it here and copy it right to my clipboard where I'm then going to open up my terminal. I'm going to cancel out of that existing Cypress process. I'm going to first export that variable for the API key as export Apple tools API key. And we're going to set that equal to my API key. And then finally, we can start back up Cypress. So now that when Cypress runs, it's going to be able to see that Apple tools API key variable to actually run the eyes SDK. So when that's starting to run, we're going to be able to get that same UI before, whereas we can see it's already popping up and we're going to be able to get started writing our new visual test. So I'm going to head back over to my code editor where the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to revert that URL so that we can see that it's back to that original URL without the bug. And we're going to first add some visual test to this. Now, the first thing that we want to do is we're going to use the Psi eyes open command where what that's going to do is it's imagine like a human eye or a camera lens. The first thing we want to do is we want to open up that lens so that we can actually start capturing light. And inside of that, we're going to pass in an argument where we can say app name, and I'm going to call it video game store. And we also want to add a test name where I'm going to call that the login or add to cart flow. That sounds good to me. And the cool thing about this is if you notice, we're actually using a command directly on that Cypress method or of that Cypress object. The entire SDK for the for Apple Tools eyes is going to be able to use those custom commands so that it's just like it's working existing out of the box with Cypress. So next, now that we have our eyes open, the next thing we want to do is we want to start capturing the pages by taking snapshots. So for the first one, we're going to say sci the eyes check window, and we want to pass in a tag for that. Now, if you're only doing one snapshot in a test, you don't need to pass in a tag, but because we're going to be doing multiple, we want to make sure that we're capturing them at different states. So this first one, we're going to say home page, where I'm going to copy that command, oops, and I'm going to paste it after we navigate over to our games URL, and I'm going to call this the game page. And then as we noticed before, we were able to add that item to cart. And we also made sure that it was showing in our cart. So I'm going to add another check window that says with cart so that we can make sure that that cart is visually showing with the correct information. And then finally, we're going to add a last one where we're going to actually eyes check window the cart page. Now, as we saw, we have our home page, our game page, our game page where we added the item to the cart, and we have the cart page itself. And then finally, just like a camera, once we're done actually taking the snapshots or the pictures with our camera, we want to close that lens. So we're going to run Psi Eyes Close, where we can now go over to Cypress and we're going to run this test. And just like before, what's going to happen is Cypress is going to open up that new instance of Chrome. It's going to start going through all those different checks where we first open up the eyes. We're going to check the home page, but then we're going to perform all those same steps as we did before. 
But as we're doing that, we can see in our terminal that Apple Tools Eyes is sending up all this information about our tests up to the Apple Tools cloud, where it's going to be able to see those snapshots and know exactly what's going on. So now we can see that we have a success. And let's go over to the Apple Tools dashboard and actually see what's going on. And once we head over to our Apple Tools dashboard, we can click this little reload button where we're going to see that we now have this new test that we found right inside of here, where we can look at all these different images. And this is exactly what we remember seeing inside of our application. We have our video game store. We have all those items on our page, and it's exactly what our homepage looks like. Now, if we click next, we can see that we have one of those for every single different snapshot that we took, where here we have our game page. We can click next and we see that we have another snapshot with that menu looking exactly like we're expecting it to, where we can easily go through and click that checkout button. And then finally, we have that cart page, which shows our item just as expected. Now, let's see what happens if we take that same bug before. If you remember, if we hover over here, we get that visual bug where we can't actually use that checkout button. Let's see what happens if we run that through with Apple tools. Now, if I head back over to my Cypress test, all I'm going to do is simply change out that URL to that branch URL. Now, once that saves, just like before, Cypress is going to go ahead and automatically re-trigger a test run and making it easy for us to not have to worry about running that manually. But just like before, it's going to go through those same exact steps, only this time it's going to use that branch URL, but we can see right in the terminal that it's sending all that information up to the Apple Tools cloud exactly like we want. But this time, uh-oh, we actually see an error in here where we can see that Apple Tools is telling us that there was a difference detected and that was in the add to cart flow. We can even get a URL here that we can open up to see what the tests actually look like. But I'm gonna instead go to the same URL back inside of my dashboard where I'm gonna click this little reload button we can see that we now have an unresolved test where if we look inside of this test, we see we have one highlighted here. And if we open that up, we can see this time we have this pink highlight over where that navigation bar is hiding part of our cart menu. Now this is flagging the issue uh, exactly like we were hoping that we have that visual bug that's actually preventing people from going through checkout. And we're getting a notification saying that there's something wrong with that test that we need to put our eyes on it. Now, another cool thing about this is inside of the Apple Tools dashboard, we can actually try to pinpoint what this issue looks like. If we go over to the root cause analysis feature, we can select that item right inside of our snapshot here. And we can see that just like we saw before when we were inspecting in the Chrome DevTools, we see the exact reason as to why this is causing an issue. And it's because there was a change in the code where we have this position relative in the ZNX of one, where it's making this navigation bar appear on top of the cart menu, making it unusable for our customers. Now, because I don't want this change to actually be approved, we can see here we have a thumbs up or thumbs down. I'm going to hit reject because we don't absolutely want that to be approved. So now we can see it's red, it's failed, and we can make sure that our developers know that there was something wrong with that, and we don't want them to use that version. Now, if we go back to our test, we can revert that to our original test and we can see what happens when we run that test one more time. So just like before, Apple Tools or Cypress saw that we saved that file, so it's automatically going to kick off that test run for us, where again, just like before, it's going to be sending all of that information up to the Apple Tools cloud, where it's going to be comparing our current state of the application that we're sending in to our baseline up in the cloud. So now that that's finished, let's head back over to Apple Tools. And if I click that reload button again, we can see that it has our new test, which says it's pass, which is great because if we look at that game page with cart, we can see that it's back to normal. We must have fixed that bug, which of course we did, but we're back in a state where we're expecting exactly what our users should be seeing, where they're able to go to this cart menu, hit the drop down, and check out to purchase that game. Awesome. So let's go back over to the slides. All right, so just a quick recap of what we actually achieved here. After reviewing our existing application, 
We ran some tests with Cypress, and we saw how it was able to actually automate some browser tasks. We then saw how we were able to use Apple tools using the eyes Cypress SDK and actually run some visual tests, which was able to take our existing Cypress tests, which were already strong and showing that functionality, and just taking them up to another level to strengthen them even more. So finally, we were able to run those tests and see exactly how it worked inside of the dashboard. So like I mentioned before, Apple Tools supports a huge variety of SDKs. You can find one for what you need for pretty much any testing framework that you already are using. So it's easy to drop in, but you can find the Cypress specific tutorial right on that same page, or you can go directly to appletools.com slash tutorials slash cypress.html. And once you're ready, you can get started with your free account over at appletools.com. And that's it. If you want to learn more or chat about the talk, you can find me everywhere at Colby Fayok. I'll also tweet out a link to some of the stuff you've seen here today. Thanks, everybody. Hey, awesome work on that. Thank, thank you, you thank so you. much, Colby. That was great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Before we even go to any of you have so many questions in the Q&A, so hopefully we can get to all of them. My biggest question, though, is what is the first game that you would get from Video Game Store? Oh, my gosh. I didn't even think about this. I'm pulling it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Gotham Knights. I don't know. Hogwarts Legacy. Yeah. I, I'm not actually familiar with most, most of those, so I totally failed this question. Dang it. Oh, come on, Colby. That's fine. That was fine. I, I very much enjoyed that as a demo, though. And actually, the first question I have then is, is the code for this project available? Could people actually see how it works? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I put it up on my on that landing page uh, after I saw somebody ask that. Um, or you can go to my gotcha. GitHub. It's under like demo e-commerce. Uh, so yeah, it's there. I can't guarantee you it's not going to like change a little bit, but um, feel free to fork and have at it. Yeah, no, that's super useful. It's always useful to be able to actually play around with things a little bit before you completely start from scratch. And that was, it was a really good explanation. I, I As I was watching it, I was kind of just like, okay, I need to write all of this down because it was really, really useful to see. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, we have we have so many questions to get through. And so um, the first one, or I guess second one now is, could you please explain the difference between pixel by pixel testing um, versus image by image comparison? Sure. I, th I think that's uh, as opposed to like the art, the uh, AI comparison. Um, and I, I, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this without using the name of the different methods, but pixel by pixel, it's going to literally go through and check every single one of those pixels, where if you have a small change and it might be for something like dynamic content, or maybe maybe the browser shifted, like my SpongeBob image there, maybe the browser shifted one pixel because you know that's how the browser is. Um, it's going to flag that entire thing or any of those code changes where with AI, particularly with Apple tools, we're using machine learning and AI and all that goodness to provide intelligent comparisons where it's going to actually consider the context of that image. And you can even add additional features onto that, like select the match type. Like we have like layout and we have content. And you can also add things like ignore regions where you're really setting up an intelligent look at your different images and that compared to your baseline so that you're not getting the flaky tests and um, the kind of things that you would typically get from pixel by pixel uh, comparisons. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I'm loving this phrase, flaky tests, and all I can think of now is soggy bottoms <laughs> and the Great British Bake Off. It's very, very I you were similar. Say frosted flakes. Different. Well, that too. That's a, well, it might be not the best kind of frosted flakes that you want. Different kind of frost. Fair. Um, Fair. But anyway, so for the image comparison tool, a little bit more, how does it deal with animated images and, and videos? Yeah, sure. So if you think of, you can think of GIFs and videos and stuff, if they're playing kind of like dynamic content, where if it's going to be playing, you're going to be taking a snapshot at a particular point in time. And you don't really know that because the browser has to load and everything needs to finish. So you kind of want to treat that as dynamic content, whether you set 
a different match type for that particular uh, DOM node, or if you want to ignore the region completely. That way you can make sure that the feature is working, but it's not like you're going to be able to capture each snapshot of a GIF, right? So it's really trying to make sure that you're ensuring the feature works, but not the content of the GIF. Totally. Totally. That, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And so this, I, because, uh, there, there's so many different web dev practices and stuff and, and all these different stacks and everything, um, because I work at Netlify, I think a lot about the kind of headless and, and serverless and everything. And, and I saw what was there, could you use some kind of headless browser, um, and do that sort of image comparison in a pipeline that way? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, funny enough. So you can run it with things like Puppeteer and Playwright. Um, I actually was just playing around with, with it in a serverless function where I'm trying to run it, uh, via an endpoint so that I can, I was going to, I'm creating it for a demo and I haven't like talked about it or anything yet. But, um, anyways, the point is that I was able to run it in a serverless function. So if I can run it there, uh, you know, you can pretty much run it headless wherever you want, as long as you can, uh, get that virtual browser that can actually go render the page and that you can get that. Uh, screenshot for it. That is a whole other level of power, and that's very good to know because now <laughs> I want to play with this as well. Yes, it, yes. And then I was you can, actually can have yeah. it live anywhere. Go ahead. Yeah, and we were actually uh, we've been working on a build plugin for Netlify uh, actually um, with the help of Jason Langsdorf. So you know, hopefully um, we're able to get that with full support. And it's you know, it's another Ooh. use case of being able to support that headlessly, right? Yeah. Oh, that would be a whole other level. Uh, especially because then it can kind of live separately from your business logic and everything. And so you can kind of keep everything modular. That is right. very exciting. And now I'm brainstorming all the different things. Um, <laughs> but I've got to keep going through all these questions because there are so many. Um, this one I think is great. Where Do you have the option to check the DOM, with, uh, beyond the DOM, but also in the DOM, on various screen sizes for responsiveness? Yeah, so that's what's awesome about the ultra fast grid. And um, I saw one of the other questions. I'll kind of answer both of these at the same time because there's, uh, um, in terms of like the OSs available and the different browsers, you can run the ultra fast grid and do like a ton of different devices all in that one test run. Um, and you're going to get, you know, like Linux, Windows, Mac, you're going to get the modern browsers and even IE, um, even though, you know, some people might have been throwing shade about IE a little bit earlier. Uh, we still need to make sure we take care of ourselves there. Um, but yeah, it's really like you can get all those device size and you can set the devices, up, uh, the sizes of the different browsers where you can do that inside of something like Cypress, but you can also do it within the eyes configuration. Cool. And I guess kind of similarly, could you then do it with design tools as well? I thought this question was very good. Could you integrate with with some kind of UI on the ideal case versus versus what has actually been produced in the code? Yeah, so you it depends on what it is. I know you can at least like upload the imagery. So um I think okay. it's you know it'd probably be hard to get like a pixel by pixel browser version of a, a mock-up inside of Envision or something. So you know you have to yeah. kind of treat that with a grain of salt where you're kind of comparing the two together and making sure it's along the same lines. But yeah, absolutely you can upload the imagery and you can, you know, work right along with the UX team or design team to make sure everybody's happy. Yeah, that that is very very cool. And so when you when you integrate all of these extra layers on top of it, it's clearly very powerful, but I guess the a big question is is it fast? Do do these visual checks slow things down at all? So not really. That, that's why it's called the ultra fast test grid, right? Um so the way that they're doing it is they're able to take the uh, snapshots and they're able to send it out to a bunch of different browsers and make sure that it's rendered with the particular uh the device, the, what you're trying to test it in, and then it's going to take all those snapshots in the Apple Tools cloud, and it's going to be, provide those fast comparisons. So it's really, really fast. Um, you know, with the ultra fast test grid, it has the word fast in it. So I think that, you know, that explains it. If it has the name fast in it, then it's fast. <laughs> that's how it works, No right? questions beyond that. Yeah, yeah. That's why all of my code is prefixed with fast dash and then whatever my app name is. That's why they call me Fast Colby. Yeah, yeah. Fast cast. Okay. Anyway, um, there. Let, let me see. Oh, we've got so many questions, and it's very, very exciting. Um, let's see. Does it also provide? Let's see. What is this question saying? Does it also provide RCA on the markup or just on CSS? 
So that's a good question. I don't know that answer for sure. I think it does, but I, mm-hmm. I can't promise that. Um, I know at least with the CSS, it provides that, but I can definitely get that answer. If uh, you want to hit me up on Twitter or something, I'd be happy to get that answer. Yeah. And here's a, another more specific question. How, how easy would it be for Apple tools to override an existing test for a UI given feature t- changes? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that one more time? Uh, for Apple tools to override an existing test for a given user interface with with different feature changes. So how how much you might okay. have to uh, rewrite and and uh, override and stuff. So you're not going to have to really rewrite your Apple tools test if just the one feature is changing inside of the same UI because you're going to be taking the snapshot of the page, for instance, and then inside of that page, you're going to have that feature change. So when that occurs, you're going to get that difference inside of Apple tools. And if you're using something like the GitHub plugin, it's going to be able to integrate with the branching strategy so that you're able to see that that branch of the visual differences and then within that, once you do have that pull request coming back in, it's able to perform that merging strategy so that you're not getting uh, weird issues with trying to make sure you're actually understanding what that difference looks like. That makes sense. I'm curious, from a team perspective, do you typically see your tools being used as uh, as something from the dev team, like the dev team implements these? Or do you have SDETs that do this, testers that do this? Is it across the spectrum? How, how does that typically work in team relationships? I definitely think it's like across the spectrum. Um, and I think we see a lot of different use cases. And especially like, because depending on the team, you know, it, they might not have as much of a support for that kind of role, which, you know, is a bummer in itself, but um, at least it's still empowering for the developers to be able to do that kind of thing with these tools mm-hmm. um, where, you know, where you rightly should have more of a quality engineering team. Uh, they'll be able to fit those tools right in as well. Yeah. And so this one, this is a very, very popular question. And and it was asked in the chat and in the Q&A for the average costs of Apple tools, if you don't mind mm-hmm. my asking. I know that you said that you can sign up for free, which is always a good thing. But what would you say is the average costs for, for lots of daily testing, small teams, large teams, that sort of thing? So if you actually want to try to get a little bit more details about that, I encourage you to go to the break room with the links right above, and you can speak with somebody from the Apple tools. But everything that I showed you today uh, is free. So yes, get started with your free account. And if you feel like you're running out of features that you want to take it to the nether level, you can definitely talk to us to look into more enterprise accounts. Nice. Thank you. That's always that's always like a funky question to ask because you want to be able to do all of the fancy stuff, but you know, there's, there's costs when you get fancy, but that's awesome that all the stuff that you did can be free. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a whole lot you can do and yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. And so in terms of browser support and everything, we have kind of poked fun at, at IE and stuff at this event, but does it cover all of them? Are there some words supported better than others? Is it, is it something where you can test many different browsers or only some? good question. So I pulled up the docs before I hopped on because I wasn't sure of the exact uh, browser list. Um, I know at least IE 10 and 11 are included in that list. I can't promise like anything outside of that. Um, But that's at least what I'm seeing supported now. But if you want to try to get a more more comprehensive question, definitely again, head over to the uh, breakout room and somebody will be able to get that answered exactly with your needs. Cool. And th- I thought this was an interesting question too. When you do these visual testing things, do you actually notice when copy changes as well? Or is it something where it, it kind of just looks at the overall layout? So that's again, depending on the match type, right? So like between things like sure. uh, the uh, the content or the, the layout, um, you're able to detect, we're able to, with the AI, detect that they are content changes. And that's what's so great about the AI-based testing as opposed to pixel by pixel, because if those content changes flag you every single time you write a new blog post, which, you know, realistically, that's, if you're trying to get a lot of content on your site, that's going to be happening often, right? So if you're constantly getting flagged, that's not really helping you out. Um, So if you're able to instead change it to a different match type, you're able to still get notified if the layout of the content changes, but still keep producing that content. Yeah, that makes sense. That is, that is really, really awesome. And that that actually answers a lot of the questions about using different amounts of data, changing when the, the copy happens. That's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, so this, and, this was another... Oh, go ahead. 
I was just gonna say, and, and if all else fails, like if you don't want to manage your con- your dynamic content that way with the match type, you can always ignore the region, um, which is kind of like the nuclear option for making sure oh, that yeah, that yeah. doesn't ever. Yeah, imagine like a time date, a date time stamp or something. Yeah, the oh, that's actually a good call. I hadn't thought of the date time thing because time yeah. is always a pain. <laughs> yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, this is this is another one. Um, at one point in development, is is boundary testing done? Is that a part of every single test run in your eyes, or is that something that's only done sometimes? I think that's a good question. And f- from my understanding, boundary testing is kind of like end to end, right? Um, but mm-hmm. I think it's really you got to kind of. I feel that you should kind of go through it with the entire workflow of feature development. And I think that goes all the way down to the UX team, in my personal opinion. And again, depends on the team, depends on the resources, whatever works best for your team. Um, but ultimately, you want to be able to capture those user flows and those end-to-end tests and making sure that pe- people are able to successfully and your tests are able to successfully go through that entire flow. So being able to capture that similar to how somebody would actually use it in practice is important. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, we're, I'm noticing the time, and I'm trying to make sure we can get to all of them. Um, and so, is it possible to host Apple tools or do some kind of on-prem in- infrastructure because of compliance reasons? What if your data never leaves your bubble? Yes, yes. So there's uh, there's a couple different options. There's enterprise. There's private cloud. And yes, we also offer the on-prem. Um, again, you know, shout out if you want to learn more about that. Head over to the break room, and somebody would be able to answer all your questions. Great. Cool. Phew. Okay. I think we have covered a lot of these, um, but dang, Colby, you're so concise. That was amazing. Um, I, I, I guess, okay, this, this is, this is just one of, one of my questions um, that I had. And, and do you ever do test driven development with visual tests? Like, do you ever, do you ever try to start with the tests there and then, and then build towards them? Or is that something that's just doesn't as, apply as much? I feel like that's a great question, and I haven't heard anybody kind of talk about that before. So I'd I'd have to ask around and see what people think. Um, but just imagining it, I mean, ultimately, you'd have to be comparing it to something, right? So if you were to do mm-hmm. that, it would be it would be basically test driven development, and that something wasn't breaking, right? Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense, and I guess that's where kind I, of I'm, like I'm curious to hear what people say. With- yeah, I guess that's where comparing it to a visual, like like an Envision or a Sketch or, or Figma or something, that could be interesting. Where it keeps failing, but then like certain regions could could apply to that. Yeah, I could see that yeah. working, but I would that's have to play with it to try it. Yeah, yeah that, that man, visual test driven development. This is this is a conference talk waiting to happen next, next year. Yeah. <laughs> well, Colby, thank you so much for your time today. It was so great talking yeah, to you. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, awesome. again, if I didn't mention it, make sure you check out the break rooms. Uh, if you want to learn more about Apple tools and everything I covered today, definitely go over and chat with our fine people over there.